And I am a fellowship trained laryngologist and many people probably haven't heard about laryngology as a subspecialty of otolaryngology. So um, we're gonna talk about what a laryngologist is and how I got here and how you can get here too if you're interested. So, so you're ready, you wanna go into um, medicine and you know everybody has these ideals of what a doctor is and what's the perfect physician and what your own perception of what you would be as a physician in the future. But I think that um, you know now in the setting of COVID, um, a lot of us have stepped you know, to the front lines to be able to navigate um, through this pandemic and also to um, you know, be team members on a national front in order to combat this pandemic. And so, you know, I think it's really commendable that uh, they're noticing the medical school applications have increased significantly um, this year, and they're actually calling it the Fauci effect. And so hats off to you guys for still committing to um, the noble specialty, even during some very, very trying times where, um, you know, we were struggling to even get face masks um, and, you know, continuously advocating for our patients during these, um, you know, unprecedented times. So um, don't give up, fight the good fight, and um, can't wait to welcome you um, alongside us. So we'll talk a little bit about, about my journey into medicine, um, and then we'll talk about my medical school experience, um, otolaryngology, which is the study of the ear, nose, and throat, and then how I ended up um, in the field of subspecialty laryngology. And we'll talk about procedures in laryngology, and then we'll have time for questions. So I want to wish that I could tell you that this is it. I was born and I knew I was going to be an otolaryngologist and I was just born and bred for this. And that's not the case. This is actually my son and we staged this whole photo shoot and I'm speaking it into existence. <laughs> he's going to be a laryngologist. He's probably not, he's probably gonna be an architect. He likes to build stuff. Um, but for me, I was actually, um, you know, lovey-dovey, love to dance loved science and medicine. My father was a general surgeon, so I was exposed to it early and I did have an affinity towards medicine quite early on. Um, however, I still enjoyed other things like the arts and things like that. So, um, you know, I had to work hard when I ultimately did have the opportunity um, to get into medicine um, and I'm continuing to work hard throughout and um, it's been quite rewarding nonetheless. So you basically put your cape on, you put yourself up by your bootstraps and you get it done. And I'll show you how I, my road to um, medicine uh, turned out. So I was born in Long Island. Um, I went to high school in Long Island. I went to undergrad at Stony Brook University in Long Island and then got my master's degree. We'll talk about that in a little bit more detail. Um, but I ultimately ended up at the University of Miami uh, Miller School of Medicine, which was an awesome uh, program to get your medical um, education from. And these are some of my classmates, which I still keep in touch with. Um, and it's challenging. I mean, there were there were sleepless nights. This is me um, actually real time studying for a gross anatomy um, practical that was going to happen in three hours. Um, and this is us doing some, um, I think we're doing the coagulation cascade on the board. Um, and then, you know, and there's also many rewarding opportunities. This is my uh, friend and I, she's ob -Gyn. We went on a medical mission trip to Nicaragua and we also had fun activities, just game days. Um, and you make these uh, relationships and you form these bonds that really last you for the rest of your life. Um, and it's been a wonderful experience. While I was in medical school, I feel like every medical school has a band, <laughs> the medical school band. Um, and so, you know, I was a classically trained pianist. I also um, sang and, and did show choir um, in high school. And so in medical school, we actually formed our own band, um, not knowing that I would ultimately wind up being a laryngologist. I didn't even know what that was at the time. Um, but typically, because laryngologists work on the voice box for the most part, 
And the specialty of ENT in general, many of us are musicians or in the performing arts by trade, um, just because you know we're very in tune to the hearing and the um, the, the singing um, component. So um, I don't think it was a coincidence that I ended up as a laryngologist. And then the bonus is that I met my husband. Um, he actually was a part of our band too, but he's a real he's a real deal singer. So. Um, so after I completed medical school, I wanted to make my application more competitive. I wanted to stay in Miami. Um, so I applied um, after doing a research fellowship um, at the University of Miami at the downtown campus um, with the head and neck surgeon that worked on biomarkers for oropharyngeal um, head and neck cancer. And um, after completing that, I wound up matching into otolaryngology at the University of Miami. So this was the day that I matched and it was definitely the happiest day of my life, um, one of them. And residency is amazing and challenging. It goes by fast while you're in it. It goes by slow, <laughs> um, but in hindsight, it's, it's, um, it's a, an amazing experience. You learn so much. Um, in such a short period of time, and you still continue learning, um, even till this day, I'm still learning as an attending. So my maiden name was St. Victor. This was just a little blurb about me on our website, residency website. This is me um, performing laser surgery as a resident on a patient that had papilloma um, lesions on their vocal cords. Um, this is me doing transoral robotic surgery or assisting um, with transoral robotic surgery, and I was actually pregnant, so it was nice to be able to sit during these surgical procedures. And this is me just doing a ear exam. We use these fancy um, auto um, microscopy um, equipment in order to really get a good look in the ear and be able to do procedures in the ear if needed in clinic. So afterwards, I completed a fellowship in laryngology. I was blessed enough to get accepted to Johns Hopkins and um, the fellowship was neurolaryngology and working alongside some of the um, amazing and world-renowned physicians as well at this institution, the University of Miami. This is uh, Dr. Cummings. He is the publisher for one of the um, renowned ENT uh, textbooks. And this is me presenting my poster for one of the studies on papilloma um, at our laryngology meeting, fall, fall voice. And no, sorry, this is a picture of the vocal folds. My husband got me this piece of artwork that's hanging up in my office. So this is a top down view looking from above at the vocal folds. And this is looking just straight on at the um, airway and the thyroid cartilages of the larynx. So my journey was a little bit all over the place um, just because there were opportunities for me to make my application a little bit more competitive. So I capitalized on that um, along the way. So in essence, I was a non-traditional medical student. Um, I think I was around 20, I was 31, I believe, when I started residency. Um, so um, a later than most, but there are people that do do it um, later for whatever reason. Um, so I did my undergrad at Stony Brook University. I majored in healthcare management, completed my pre-med prerequisites. I did a two-year uh, research um, internship at a national laboratory on Long Island. Subsequently, I went to Bear University. I got a master's degree in biomedical sciences. Um, and then I took, I guess, a pseudo gap year in a way. Um, while I was applying for medical school, I worked as a pharmaceutical sales representative. It was a really interesting experience because it was quite different from medicine. I had the opportunity to discuss medicine, that I was really, really enthusiastic about the mechanism of action and how, effic how effective they were in managing high blood pressure and diabetes and things like that. Um, however, the business component um, didn't really spark me the way that the treatment in, in the medical and clinical and establishing rapport with patients did. Um, so I um, was happy that I had still my primary goal was to get into medical school. So I matched 
into the University of uh, Miami Miller School of Medicine, finished my um, four years there, and then I did a year at the University of Miami. My medical school um, was the satellite campus in Boca Raton, so I didn't really have a lot of exposure to the ENT department in our main campus. Um, and so I wanted to get um, establish a relationship there so I could get strong letters. Um, and so that research fellowship did help me with that. The university, uh, then I applied for residency. I got into my first choice, which was University of Miami Miller School of Medicine. Um, that's five years. And then I decided that I wanted to do fellowships. So I matched into Johns Hopkins for laryngology fellowship. So this is just like uh, a map for, for typically medical careers. We we're moving all over the place in order to graduate, get our degrees and, you know, uh, get into a residency. And so I just thought that that was a funny map depicting that. So um, I just wanted to point out that don't let life or your ideals of how you want your life pathway to proceed to stop you from achieving anything. Um, you know, I was a resident, otolaryngology residency is very, very challenging. Um, second year was, is, is typically the most challenging year. Um, you do a general surgery intern year, your first year. Um, and some people think that's the hardest outside of ENT, but for those of us that completed the residency, the second year of ENT residency actually um, is more challenging than the general surgery intern year. Um, so was not gonna conceive at that moment, but um, I was pregnant during my third year. Um, and we kind of planned it because I, you have a research year, oftentimes in some institutions, um, you may have two research months um, or so. so. It facilitated the, you know, me being able to have my baby and not put ruffle the waters too much in regards to the residency program and the day-to-day -day functioning. Um, so it was great experience. Um, it was hard, but I didn't know what pregnancy was like without being um, in residency. So you just do it. Um, and then in fellowship, I had my second child. Um, and again, that was also great. And the transition to um, fellowship where you are now a, a clinical instructor, um, the schedule is a little bit easier in comparison to residency and you have a little bit more autonomy. So um, that pregnancy was a little bit easier. So now I am an attending at the University of Tennessee Health Science Center. I took the opportunity to start up a voice, airway, and swallowing division. Um, I'm the first fellowship trained laryngologist in Shelby County, so that's really awesome. And it's just been a great opportunity to collaborate with um, many um, like-minded, um, younger attendings. Um, Dr. Boyd Gillespie is the chair there and he's done a great job at building up that program and we're all enthusiastic about his vision. Um, and we also have some seasoned attendings that have been there for many, many years as well that help us navigate the system. Um, and so we're growing this program program and you know we have residents that we um, work very intimately with this is me doing an airway case um, at the height of the pandemic and then this is starting telemedicine um, during the pandemic as well so the residents have had an interesting role in participating in this journey and it's been really great um, getting them exposed to that um, as well um, and then the, the other component in addition to um, being an in, in academic physician is research. So we do a lot of research. Um, if you want, it's up to you um, when you decide to go out to practice. But I really enjoy contributing and making contributions and ENT kind of lends itself toward that environment of contributing um, significantly to research because there's so much to learn and so much to do. Um, so many of us take initiative and do that. So, I'm gonna tell you guys about the process as best as I can. Pre-med years, I am 18 years out from pre-med. So I don't wanna tell you these old folk tales about when I was in you know, pre-med and how this worked out for me. But what I do think is very important and will be a recurring theme as I talk about the process is mentorship. So as a pre-med, um, you know, it's important for you to go out and explore, um, you know, 
anything that your heart desires and anything that you're interested in just so that when you do hit the ground running in medical school, you can kind of have a little bit of an edge in knowing what you like and what you don't. Um, there are some opportunities. I'm on the medical uh, school committee for UT. Um, and a lot of the students have had, even during high school, some opportunities to do some shadowing, which is great. And some people don't know that they want to go um, into medicine that early on. So, you know, that's fine if you don't. But as soon as you do and you do commit to that and you're in your pre-med years, you know, you don't need a formal program to do, to find a mentor. You could just, you know, find your local medical school and say, hey, is there anybody available that would be able to to guide me through the process where I can shadow for a few days, you know, um, and that will be invaluable in helping you navigate through the system, particularly for the more competitive specialties, such as ENT, neurosurgery, radiology, orthopedics, dermatology, and such. So choosing a specialty is challenging. I mean, you go in there and you like everything. You don't want to commit. You don't want people to not, you know, show interest in you because you're not showing interest in their specialty. Um, and as you go through medical school, there'll be certain nuances that some hold true about certain specialties. And you'll see if your personality fits in addition to what you're looking for in a, having a fulfilling career. So um, for me, what I notice and what is the uh, stereotype for the otolaryngologist is that we're just nice people. Um, we really enjoy, you know, ourselves and we enjoy being around each other. We work hard, but we really do get along and we, we have pretty decent bedside manner as well. Um, and that really struck, stuck out to me. Um, and so, you know, that was the initial um, impression that I got and it remains true even as I uh, move forward in my career and I'm now in attending. So you want to find what personality fits you in addition to what you're looking for for career uh, fulfillment. So early on, you know, you have to figure out medical, surgical, or a little bit of both. And there are specialties that do um, combine the medical and the surgical aspects of medicine quite nicely. ENT definitely being one of them. Urology is another one. I think ob in my opinion, is also a little medical and surgical as well. So I knew that I wanted something that was challenging. Um, and my husband sometimes is a little overwhelmed by my competitive nature, as you can see in that picture. Um, something that required a decent amount of manual dexterity. And so surgery was very, very um, um, interesting to me. And my dad was a general surgeon too. So I kind of got to see that personality, that lifestyle. Um, and so I really was interested in that component, but I also like to develop relationships with my patients. I really enjoy continuity of care. I like to watch them grow, so to speak, um, while I'm treating them. Um, so otolaryngology definitely allowed for that. And then laryngology also further um, contributed to those, um, those uh, characteristics that I was looking for in a specialty. So I played the piano. I really love building things. I love putting things together, you know, furniture, Ikea. I love it. I love it all. Um, and so that really was what made me lean towards surgery. I love using tools. I love using new cool tools. Um, pottery was fun, though that was probably not my strongest um, suit. Um, but building and painting, um, in addition to playing the piano, you know, building forts with my son, and then swatting flies while I'm returning emails, multitasking, teaching, all were things that I knew that I needed in a specialty. Um, and otolaryngology definitely gives you that. So you start off medical school and you learn the normal physiology, then you learn the pathophysiology of every single organ system. It's overwhelming. It's like drinking from a fire hydrant. And so is residency. It's all like drinking from a fire hydrant. But oftentimes, and not always, there are some people who are like, I still love everything, or I don't even know what I want to do. But sometimes there'll be that one particular organ system that stands out to you and just lights you up. And for me, that was otolaryngology. And I remember distinctly um, 
dissecting the facial nerve branches in my head and neck anatomy gross dissection class intricately, like branches of branches. I dissected branches to the branches um, and was very proud of that, that they were intact and, you know, looking at all of the intricacies of the head and neck and the nooks and crannies and so much that we don't see, you know, um, and that we have to use special equipment to visualize, to assess. That was really neat to me. So I knew there was something to the head and neck. And then we had a speaker come and talk to us about um, otolaryngology and I shadowed him. And that one opportunity, I uh, I found that he went in one room and it would be a child with an ear infection. And then the next patient that we saw would be a, an older gentleman with a jawbone cancer. And I was like, this can never get boring. There's no way. There's so much variety. Um, and so, you know, I did a sub internship, um, a pre sub internship. I actually was able to do a, a pre sub internship at an outside institution before my sub internship. And um, I loved it long days, didn't matter. I was still enthusiastic about it every single day. Um, Sub-internships are basically your opportunity to function as an intern and to um, perform and you're being assessed while you're doing it, but you're basically getting to know the program a little bit better and they're also getting to know you um, as well. Um, so Diversity of the patients, clinical and circle balance, and the um, head and neck anatomy are what really drove me into um, otolaryngology. So medical school years, you finally decide what you want to do. For otolaryngology, research is pretty important. It's good if you can get into research that is relevant to the specialty, but if not, if you do some meaningful research, you see a study along from start to finish, from birth to fruition and publication, and you're the first author on that particular publication, that is equally valuable as well. Um, if you, you know, some people just change their, their interests and, um, you know, they may have started with cardiology and have amazing cardiology research, but then, you know, second or third year, they switch to ENT. That's fine. As long as you have an explanation for it, it's fine. Um, you definitely want to get in at shadowing early on in your medical school career, because those are going to foster relationships where you will have mentors that will last you a lifetime. And then you want to do your clinical rotations. You want to, if you are in your third year, you can do a, a junior uh, sub-internship where you get exposure to the specialty if you haven't already. Um, and then your fourth year, you want to make sure you get into your otolaryngology sub-internships early so that you can get strong letters of recommendations. You may want to consider away rotations at other institutions as well um, and, and um, just get your name out there. So there was a paper out of uh, Ohio State University that just came out at the beginning of the year that talks about implementation of ENT mentorship programs and how um, valuable that was during the application for the application process um, because the medical students that were enrolled in this program actually all of them matched and not some of them changed out of ENT but still all of them matched. So I think there's something to say about the importance of mentorship. And I think it needs to be emphasized more than it is because you have somebody who's a mentor helping you navigate through the system um, and they can guide you, you foster relationships. Um, and it's just priceless because even beyond match, you will still likely keep in touch with them and they'll have wisdom to impart on you um, throughout. So I would say mentorship from pre-med years is equally as important as, um, in your medical school years as well. So head and neck anatomy, like I said, it's like all of these secret uh, crevices with all of these amazing um, organs that contribute to such important functioning for our day to day. I mean, breathing, talking, eating, hearing, you know, and it's not things that you see for the face value and look at and assess. You know, we have to oftentimes do scopes to assess these areas or we get imaging, CT scans, MRIs to assess these areas. But I think what is awesome is that you can assess these in real time while being awake. For me, for laryngology, I scope every one of my patients to get a good look at their vocal folds. So, you know, it's not something that every clinician does. This is something that only I do as an otolaryngologist and that's pretty neat to me. 
So like I said, we see babies, teenagers, adults, elderly, the full gamut. Um, and the disorders that we see are also pretty diverse. So voice and uh, swallowing disorders, hearing loss, dizziness, sleep disorders and sleep surgery, salivary gland tumors, pediatric everything. Um, ENT related. We do plastic surgery and reconstruction, sinonasal disease and infection, smell disorder has been really on the forefront, particularly during the COVID pandemic, trauma, facial trauma, airway trauma, airway obstruction from a tumor, a mass, scar tissue, nosebleeds, throat bleeds, both can be life-threatening. Cancer and non-cancerous tumors, both can be life-threatening and are urgent. And because we are in such close proximity to important things, raging infections of ear, nose, or throat could affect the skull base, could affect the brain, could affect the eyes, could affect your throat and uh, could occlude your breathing. So, you know, there are significant amount of emergencies in ENT. And I think it's important to look at that. What specialty are you interested in and how urgent are the, um, the urgencies? And when I started my uh, residency, you know, you get a consultation for a nosebleed, but you want to treat everything as a diagnosis you can't afford to miss. Um, and so the level of urgency for a lot of things in ENT is quite high. Um, you know, and then I started to think of other specialties and like, well, urology, you have, I guess, Fournier's gangrene, which is a really bad raging infection um, that needs to be treated urgently. And, I, you know, they have their urgent things too. So you just want to figure out how urgent are these things? How passionate am I about it? And it's going to significantly impact your training, um, you know, so considering those things and, and um, how enthusiastic you are about the subspecialty is also um, important and can make a difference in your career selection as well. So, so much variety in this one specialty and you probably haven't seen any of these cool instruments. This is a scope, um, a rigid scope for sinus surgery. So that's how we access um, a lot of the secret places in the head and neck. It's endoscopic, so you don't always have to make a big incision, particularly for cosmetic purposes. You, you wanna um, avoid that if you can. Um, and so you have your sinus scopes here. This is a patient that has a tracheostomy tube in their neck. If they are you know, uh, having some respiratory issues and either from the lung and they can't get off of the uh, vent machine or um, any obstruction from above, then sometimes they will require a breathing tube in the neck to bypass it. Um, this is a cochlear implant, you know, giving somebody their hearing back, super rewarding. Um, and then Botox, fillers, rhinoplasties, which are nose jobs, facelifts, all the things um, are part of otolaryngology. So my why. Um, the real why in hindsight um, is when I was younger, I always thought that this, this may sound a little bit uh, random, but when I was younger, I always thought the soul was in the, the neck region or in the chest region. And, you know, I always thought that your voice was essentially your, it's you, it's the essence of who you are. So it could be technically like your soul. You know, our voice allows us to speak, you know, and can identify somebody by their voice um, on the phone. You don't necessarily have to see them. So the voice is unique in the, way that it allows us, it's our instrument, um, whether you're a professional voice user or a singer or not, it is your instrument and allows you to communicate with the outside world. And, you know, if you're not visible, it is a very, very poignant identifying um, characteristic. Um, and so that's why I think I thought at a young, very young age that the voice box or this area was a soul. I didn't know what the voice box was, but um, fast forward to residency. And I had a patient come in while I was on call that had breathing difficulty. We quickly assessed him and he had scar tissue, we call stenosis in his airway. And so we took him to the surgery, assessed the scar tissue and we were able to open it up and um, his breathing improved. However, scar tissue like that can recur. Um, so we opted to do a tracheal resection down the line where you basically cut the abnormal part of the airway out and you hook it back up. 
Um, so we performed this procedure on him and he still required a trach afterwards um, just because there was some instability in the hookup. Um, and so to ensure that his airway was okay and that he would be breathing okay after the surgery, we put the breathing tube back in. Um, you know, over time, you in residency, you switch rotation. So I, I gave him my um, number so that he could keep in touch and let me know how he was doing. Um, and several months later, he sent me a message and said, my trick is out. Thank you so much. And I auditioned for this dance um, position and I got it. So this is um, my patient from residency. This is guy here. So he's, I mean, he is, in my opinion, he's killing it and he can breathe obviously. And um, he doesn't have a strike in place. So that's just such a rewarding thing to see. Um, and when you give somebody their life back and I've had patients that were obese and overweight. And when you address their airway issues, they're able to improve their health significantly because they can work out without getting short of breath and enjoy their life. Um, my other why is my husband. I told you he's also a singer. And so, you know, when I was pregnant with our first child, um, I didn't know if I was going to be able to pursue a career in laryngology because I felt compelled to go into practice so that we could, you know, finally support our family and start our lives. Um, but he really encouraged me to go forward because I was so passionate about voice around uh, my third and fourth year of residency. So. And then I get to take care of his voice as well. So what exactly is laryngology? If you look it up on the um, Google, it'll give you this very, very bland definition that says it's the diseases of the larynx. And there's so much more to it. Um, the larynx is so important because it has three important functions. You talk because of your vocal cords. You are able to breathe. Um, because of the larynx and the trachea, and you swallow because of the esophagus that's intimately involved with the larynx and all the surrounding muscles that work in coordination to allow you to swallow. And so, you know, dealing with that, you can imagine the variety of um, pathology that can be addressed as a laryngologist, um, not for just professional voice users, but, you know, for all patients. Um, and so, you know, it's a specialty that I'm very passionate about um, and that not a lot of people know about, but I think we're getting some notoriety um, as we move forward. Um, and it's different from general otolaryngology because general otolaryngologists don't use a lot of the equipment that we use as laryngologists, and I'll show you some of them. Um, some do, and, and some do use it well, um, but there are cer certain surgical nuances that a laryngologist um, is able to treat diseases in a specific way, you know, using fancy equipment like lasers and things like that, that general otolaryngologists may not use. So. so this is the larynx. You have the thyroid cartilage here and the vocal folds are actually housed in the thyroid cartilage. Here's a muscle that's depicting the cricothyroid muscle that elongates the vocal cords to change the pitch. Um, and a hyoid bone includes the larynx, and that's basically where the muscles of the throat called the strap muscles um, attach and help with swallowing as well as speech. And then you have the cricoid cartilage, which is a prominent cartilage where a lot of the muscles and other cartilage is attached to. Um, and this is the proximal trachea, which we also deal with. Behind all of this is your esophagus, your food tube. So swallowing um, is intimately involved, like I said. And so this is just a video showing. This is left vocal fold, right vocal fold. This is where you breathe your windpipe. Behind here is your esophagus. And then over here is your, um, where you breathe again. So the vocal folds open to breathe and then they close when you're talking. And then they also close when you're swallowing to protect your airway. So one of the main differences in, um, in, in the perception of the voice box, basically between a laryngologist and maybe a general otolaryngologist is our ability to assess um, certain properties that clue us into the histo histology of the vocal folds. So one of the um, uh, equipments that we use is a laryngoscope. 
And that there's two types. There's the flexible, which is uh, uh, basically a tube that you put through the nose, a camera. So look at the vocal folds. And the other type is a rigid um, laryngoscope that you put through the mouth. And the um, equipment, the fancy equipment is called a stroboscopy. And that basically gives you, number one, a high definition view of the vocal folds, but it also allows you to assess on a histological level, the uh, properties of the vocal folds. So there's the, the lining of the vocal folds here. These are the two vocal folds on a transverse cut view. And then you have the superficial lamina propria. And so the crux of vocal production is the superficial lamina propria and surgical intervention to the voice box. Um, if, you, if you manipulate or um, damage this area, it could have a significant impact on the voice because this, viscous layer allows for the vocal folds um, to have this wave. And the wave is very important in, vo in voice production. Um, so I'll show you an example. Oh, and really, really neat. The vocal folds are um, cycling 100 to 300 cycles per second. So imagine that. That's like the most busiest muscle in your body is the thyroretinoid muscles, which are here, the vocalis thyroid muscle complex. So 100 to 300 cycles per second. That's amazing. So um, this is the rigid stroboscopy and that really gives you an awesome view of the vocal folds. Um, and it goes through the mouth and you suddenly become a sword swallower, not really, but um, it goes to the back of the tongue and the camera actually is perpendicular. So it looks down. So the camera is actually looking here downwards onto your vocal folds. So I teach the residents um, how to do the stroboscopic exam and they practice on each other and on me. So I, I have a really wicked gag, so <laughs> it didn't go that well, but you basically wanna be sitting upright, um, kind of in a dog snip position and the doctor um, holds the patient's tongue and you pass the scope to the back of the tongue and that's my epiglottis right there. And then you see my vocal fold. I actually have a little polyp on my right vocal fold. Um, I have two kids, so five and three. Um, so I get a lot of vocal mileage um, and I gagged right there. So it, it was quite short lived. Um, and I don't look happy in that picture either, but um, it was fine. That was probably the seventh person to scope me at that moment. So that's why I look that way. Um, but this is a great exam. This is one of the speech language pathologists that I actually work with. And that's the wave that I'm talking about. So the stroboscopic exam works by the light flashing on different points of the cycle and kind of like a cartoon flip book, it gives you different points of the wave propagation, but it slows it down so that you can see that it's <coughs> symmetric, it's that it's not reduced, that you get complete closure, that the vocal cords are opening and closing at the same way, that it's well lubricated. Um, so you see there, it didn't catch, but then there you go. So that's the mucosal wave that we're looking at with a stroboscopy exam. So it would be reduced in the setting of a lesion or a mass on the vocal cord that you maybe you can't even see that's discrete. And it may be increased if there is paralysis or weakness of the muscle and that flaccidity causes the vocal folds to vibrate a little bit more. Um, and you also wanna look for symmetry between the two as well. So laryngology came more apparent as more celebrities um, actually had um, pathology that needed to be addressed and was impacting their career. So 2006, we started looking at these um, voice lifts or this aesthetic laryngology where patients, particularly older patients, have this thinning of the vocal cords. And that's a normal physiologic phenomenon where the vocal folds thin out. It's called atrophy. Um, and so started injecting them with some filler, the filler that we use for wrinkles and things as such. Um, and that helped to augment the voice of an older patient. Um, we do that very commonly now. So it's not as, as novel as it was back in 2006. Um, but then you move forward and now Rachel Ray needs vocal fold surgery for assist. Um, and you always heard her being hoarse on her talk on her television show. So um, she sounds markedly better. Um, we have um, Adele. Adele had a vocal full hemorrhage and she had to cancel her concert. And, you know, it's very important as a laryngologist, as a clinician to tell these 
people who their careers rely on their voice that, you know, you have to take that into consideration um, that you can do significant amount of damage if you don't pull out from your show, um, at least temporarily while we are fixing things. Um, and that's a very difficult conversation to have. Um, and Adele and then Celine and all these singers started, you know, coming to the forefront about their, you know, difficulties with their vocal injuries. And one of the talk show hosts, Chanel Jones on the Today Show also had vocal fold surgery right before our famous Fauci um, had vocal fold surgery. And I gotta tell you, I knew he had a polyp every time he spoke. I just wanted to just put a scope down his throat and take a look um, to assess it because, you know, he sounded like he had a lesion and he was doing all these, you know, speaking engagements. And um, I'm glad that he got the care that he needed. And because he's doing a lot of speaking engagements, it's important for him. And he mentioned this um, when he was talking to Chanel Jones um, that um, they do voice therapy. So that's good. So laryngology is a lot more than meets the eye. Um, we do a variety of awake in office procedures, which is one of the things that I love about laryngology. It's immediate results for both you and the patient, um, immediate gratification for both you and the patient. A lot of awake procedures, you really gotta build trust with your patients to be able to do these awake procedures because you know it's on the vocal folds and that's pretty challenging to access. Um, and then, you know, opening up an airway, allowing a patient to breathe, allowing a patient to eat. Um, and then you have multidisciplinary approaches, um, particularly with speech language pathologists, which are an amazing group of people that I truly enjoy um, working with and they help with every component, voice swallowing and respiratory retraining, so. So with an awake injection, typically you use um, a filler and this is Restylane. Um, there's several types. Um, and you numb the patient up really well with um, sprays and lidocaine drips. You have a five milliliter syringe for the numbing medicine, a one uh, milliliter tuberculin syringe that you put the gel in, and you use this cannula, this oral tracheal injection cannula to drip the lidocaine on the vocal cords to numb them. And this is just a handheld, uh, piston-like thing that helps to stabilize your hand while you're injecting. Um, and this is the needle, it's a special needle. It has to be, a, it's 28 gauge, I believe. Um, the smaller, the better, because you don't wanna be um, poking a lot of holes in the vocal folds because then the filler will inevitably um, extravasate or pop out. So the patient is seated again in an upright position. You have somebody hold their tongue. Stabilizing their back is quite helpful because sometimes they want to retract and move back. And you're standing right in front of the patient, getting a good view. Um, and you have one hand with the camera and the other hand with the in, uh, injection cannula. And you use that cannula for dripping the lidocaine, like I said before, and then you switch the syringe to the gel uh, or whatever material you're injecting into the vocal fold. So this is one that I did. <laughs> So um, this is the uh, patient has left vocal fold paralysis. So it's upside down. So left is right and right is left. You can see the right cord moving really well. And then you wanna inject in what we call the paraglottic space. If you inject anywhere inside of the vocal fold or closer, then you risk manipulating um, the superficial lamina propria, the space that I talked about before. And that could have de deleterious effects on the voice because you're essentially um, impacting the wave at that point. Um, and so you could see the, the vocal fold plumping up um, and that just helps so that the other cord doesn't have to work so hard to get closure because otherwise with vocal fold paralysis, oftentimes these patients have difficulty swallowing because there's a gap since the cords can't close very efficiently um, and that gap can allow liquids to you know, trickle down into the airway and for them to, to cough a lot. Baby, I'm, I'm in the middle of a meeting, okay? I know, give me one second, okay? I'll be back. Um, so um, um, yeah, so when they can't close, liquids could fly through and then if they can't close, air could escape. So typically they have a very breathy voice and they sound like they're winded and they actually feel winded as well. Um, and so filling that vocal fold allows for them to have a reduction in that gap and improvement in those symptoms. Um, one 
so you don't know when the vocal fold nerve is going to come back. If it's not cut, you often wait eight to 10 months before the vocal fold nerve is declared not gonna regain function. Um, or if they had a surgery where the nerve needed to be cut, sometimes you just go straight to what we call the medialization thyroplasty. And that's an awake procedure as well, but this one's done in the operating room. And um, I'll show you what we do. So basically you make an incision in the neck and you wanna open up the um, muscles of the neck. You get down to the muscles first and then you um, open up the strap muscles of the neck. And then when you separate the strap muscles in the neck, you go down into onto the thyroid cartilage, which I showed you before. Um, and the thyroid cartilage um, gives you access to the paraglottic space, which is next to the vocal folds. Um, once you get down to the thyroid cartilage, you wanna drill a hole and the measurements are approximately about half a centimeter back from midline, 0.3 centimeters from the bottom um, part of the thyroid cartilage and you drill a hole um, in that area that allows you to be approximately at the level of the vocal folds. And um, once you get access into that area, I typically scope the patient just so I make sure that there are no tears and they're able to breathe and they still um, have a patent airway. Keep in mind they're awake during this. Um, they get a little bit of medicine to make them feel good, um, but they are cognizant because you wanna be able to kind of tune them up like a piano while you're putting this implant in. And this is a Gore-Tex implant that um, basically pushes the vocal cord kind of like the way that it plumped up with the, the injection, but this stays in. And then you have the patient talk and kind of feel out, is this comfortable? Is this sound like your normal voice? And once you've achieved based on your perception, as well as the patient's perception, the ideal positioning, then you want to put the scope, um, this time it's through the nose in the surgery, um, and take a look at the vocal fold and make sure that you've gotten a good position and that the airway is still patent. Um, and then you close the patient up. They typically do well. Um, afterwards, I still give patients, uh, recommend voice therapy afterwards, just because it's like trying on a new pair of heels you know, you got to break them in and, and get a little used to it. So um, voice theory kind of helps to optimize the surgical intervention. So lasers, love lasers. That's one of the reasons, again, why I got into otolaryngology because lasers are pretty neat and exciting. Um, we use a variety of lasers for our procedures. Me, I use the KTP laser, which stands for potassium titanyl phosphate. Um, it has a wavelength of 528 nanometers, and the chromophore is basically the, the um, particle or the substance that absorbs the laser. Um, and for KTP laser, it's hemoglobin. So that is why it's often coined a photoangiolytic laser, because you get really good hemostasis, and it attacks at the blood vessel level. Um, and because it does that, you can really get good... Um, uh, hemostasis or control of bleeding, particularly when you're wearing, working in such a small area. Like you want to make sure that you're, you know, a small drop of blood is so significant in laryngology that, um, you know, it could really throw off your orientation. So the KTP laser is really good at controlling that. And it also doesn't allow for heat distribution to dissipate in the tissues very much, um, particularly when you put it on a pulse setting where it's not a continuous blast of the tissue. And that's important because the tissues are so fry, uh, uh, um, fragile, you know, if it has significant scarring or any effect like that, it could, again, significantly impact the voice. So our perspective as a laryngologist is really, really big on voice preservation, even when we're dealing with cancers. So when we deal with early cancers of the vocal cords, we focus on voice preservation um, while obviously making it important to get rid of the cancer um, as best as possible. So this is what the KTP laser looks like. It just looks like a box, nothing exciting, but this is the setup. So the patient sits here, you have your screen here, the KTP laser is here, you have suction set up, smoke evacuator, because it can get really smoky in there. And then um, you basically feed the laser fiber. It's a thin, thin, thin fiber, like 0.3 mil, um, um, three mil, microns, sorry, um, into the working channel port of the flexible scope. And then you have your suction here too, as well. So uh, because of its affinity to hemoglobin, you know, there's this concern that it can affect the um, 
eyes, the retina. So we wear our uh, goggles in order to protect against that. And they're orange in order to counteract the laser. Um, and then you want to really anesthetize patients really well. We do a, an injection into the voice box, the cricotracheal injection. It gives a really good dense uh, anesthesia. And you put a little bit of jelly in the nose, spray the throat um, as well. You're in there for up to 30 minutes. After 30 minutes, the anesthesia wears off and some patients tend to gag a lot. Um, so you wanna maximize that time and make them as comfortable as possible. And so this is just an action shot of me doing the laser um, procedure on a patient um, and it, it, it flashes. So um, I'll show you what that looks like here. This patient has uh, hypervascular blood vessels on their voice box. Um, they are actually a singer. It's not the same, it's not this patient. They're a singer and they notice a significant difference in their voice. They had a bleed before. And so we wanted to make sure that the blood vessels were um, uh, basically obliterated um, because you don't wanna start them on voice therapy to eliminate the traumatic behaviors before taking care of the vessels because they may risk bleeding again. Um, and so because she already had a hemorrhage, um, we thought it would be prudent for her to have those vessels addressed. So uh, oftentimes patients won't be able to go to surgery because for whatever reason, they have a lot of comorbidities or when we do do endoscopic approaches to the voice box, it requires a significant amount of neck extension. I had one patient that had like literally no movement of their uh, cervical spine and they were actually awaiting uh, spine surgery um, to address it, but there was a sp suspicion of voice box cancer. Um, so I had to do a biopsy somehow to get the diagnosis and we did an awake biopsy. And so typically in patients that have um, risk factors, drinking, smoking, and then they have leukoplakia, which is white lesions on the vocal fold or just angry looking, ugly lesions on the vocal fold. Um, you, you typically wanna get a biopsy to confirm uh, or rule out cancer. Oh, hold on a second. So this is uh, the vocal fold, the left side, the right side. Um, you go in the same scope that we use for the laser, but instead of fishing the laser fiber through, you fish a pair of forceps through there. And then um, this right vocal fold looks abnormal, irregular. Um, and even in the, the, this part of the vocal fold is called anterior commissure. Right at the um, apex, um, you want to get good biopsies of those regions. So, and it's not, you, you numb them up really well. They typically tolerate it really well. Most patients just say that they feel um, pressure, not a significant amount of pain. But you want to make sure you have a, a lesion that is visible, that is obvious, um, not anything that's questionable because then you have low, you can't biopsy, you know, for hours. You have to be very, very um, diligent about getting the biopsy um, again because the numbing wears off and it could tend to be uncomfortable towards the end. So for patients that can go endoscopic surgery, this is typically what the equipment looks like. I use a, what we call a suspension gallows system by Zytel. Um, and you basically have this attachment to the bed. Um, and not all laryngologists use this, um, but more laryngologists use it than a general ENT would. Um, and this gives you perfect access to the voice box. And then you use a high definition microscope in order to visualize the vocal folds and allow you to have bimanual dexterity to perform surgical interventions. So all of our instruments are very long. It, the microscope is about 400 um, millimeter focal length um, for your surgeries from your eye to the uh, larynx. So all of your instruments are going to be long. So these are um, my suctions, my scope, tooth guards to protect the teeth, suction catheters, you know, scissors, injection cannula is right there. And then this is my tray with my cup forceps, my scissors and my blades longer suctions as well, another camera with a zero degree um, telescope, and then surgical gowns. So we have a lot of fun toys um, that we use. Um, and this is a video just showing you, um, this is a polypoid lesion on the left vocal fold. You can see it, this is not my surgery, um, but this is basically how we do phonomicrosurgery. So, you know, like I said, blood in this field, as you see, um, it could be minimal, like, a fraction of a milliliter and it, it
can really occlude your view. So we're very meticulous about maintaining hemostasis because you want to not violate and go deeper than you need to. Um, so you have a pledget, which is just a, a cottonoid with um, small balled up material. And some people use oxymetazolone, which is hemostatic agent. So I use uh, epinephrine, um, diluted epinephrine. Um, and so you elevate this um, off of the vibratory edge of the vocal fold because lesions in this area have a significant impact on the voice. And so these can be caused by trauma, um, traumatic behaviors. Um, and so uh, you definitely want to make sure that they get into voice therapy both before um, because they're going to need voice rest afterwards. And um, you want to teach them how to ramp up their voice. Whispering, terrible. Like it has to be strict, strict voice rest. Um, and so you cut the lesion off and make sure you get good control of the bleeding and it's as if you were never there. So I would imagine this patient did very well after. This is um, one of the surgeries that I actually did. This was a lady, she was a manager for a, a, a well-known company and she noticed that her voice was just significantly impacting her ability to perform her job, a lot of vocal fatigue. She did have some roughness to her voice and she wound up having what we call an uh, cyst in the vocal fold. There's two types, there's mucus retention cyst and then there's epidermoid cyst. Both are not related to trauma, but they can significantly impact your voice. So if you're a professional voice user, oftentimes we remove them and she also did great after surgery. So this is the cyst right in here that you could see and I'm slowly but surely working my way around it to dissect it out. So moving on to airway procedures. Um, so this is the vocal fold again, right side, left side. This is the front, this is the back. And then here you see this irregular looking tissue. This is scar tissue. Um, and sometimes it could be caused by prolonged um, breathing tube in the windpipe that causes pressure on the um, voice on the on the windpipe and you know a milieu of perfect storm that causes this scar tissue to form rapidly. Um, Sometimes it's idiopathic, and that's very common among Caucasian women, um, middle-aged women as well. Um, sometimes it could be autoimmune related. So there's a various cause, and now with COVID, we're seeing a lot of these post-intubation COVID related um, scar tissues in the airway. So the treatment is pretty much um, the same. There's multiple ways to attack this disease. I enjoy endoscopic procedures. Um, and so typically you go in and- <laughs> Sorry, my music is very, very loud and obnoxious, but um, you go in with a balloon and you can see the before and after. This is before. Um, this is a closer look at the scar tissue. You can see normal tracheal rings below that. And then you just cut the scar and then you use a balloon to kind of open it up. Um, and so the airway significantly improved. This is one of my patients that um, had an unfortunate car uh, motor vehicle accident history was undiagnosed for scar in the airway for a, quite a long time and subsequently was found to have baby I'm almost done okay uh yeah go ahead um was subsequently found to have um scar tissue in her airway and you can see that the scar tissue is I mean significantly um obstructing her airway um, and so again, we use this balloon right here to open it up and she's had um, great results with that. After the surgery, I inject with steroids and I do that um, periodically in clinic and that really helps to keep the scar tissue at bay. Hold on one second. Yes, buddy. Yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Look, look, look. Wow, okay. Baby, let me look afterwards. I'm giving a presentation. Come, come say hi. <laughs> Sorry, guys. No, I can't, buddy. I'm teaching. Okay. So you can look and then do it. No, go ahead. I'll be right back. I'll be right back, buddy. I'll be right back. Watch? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> That's my my eldest son. Sorry. So um, so yeah, they do serial injections, and oftentimes with the steroid injections, they don't require. Um, surgical intervention, or at least it's prolonged between surgical interventions. Because like I said, the scar tissue tends to reform. Um, 
This is another patient that had what we call posterior glottic stenosis. So it's scar tissue in the back of the vocal folds, and that can cause the vocal folds to be fixed and scarred down in a closed position. So you can't really breathe well. Um, and so um, in assessing this patient, um, I did a Mattern procedure, which is not really well known unless you do a laryngology fellowship. Um, and you have to have the right patient to do it on. And so this is just below the vocal cords, and this is the, the, the edge of scar on the back of the vocal cords, and this is the breathing tube going into the airway. So um, basically, you do endoscopic approach. Um, you take, you, you denude or you remove the lining of the um, back part of the airway um, and just eliminate that scar tissue. And you take a piece of skin, which is, it's a split thickness skin graft from the thigh, and you wrap it up on the stent um, that you create with a piece of material that helps the skin to not stick to the stent. Um, and then you place this in the airway. And this is just below the level of the vocal cords in the area that I took the scar tissue out. And then they need a trach after that. So you put a breathing tube in the neck because you have to keep the stent in for about three weeks. And you can see um, after three weeks, we remove the stent and um, the skin is actually on the airway. So this is desquamation of the skin, but you can see the resolution of the scar tissue. And this is me looking through the trach hole up to the undersurface of the vocal cords and they're moving again, which is great. Um, so this patient is doing really, really well. I actually did this patient um, during my fellowship and she came out and she's talking, breathing, eating without any issues. So lastly, you know, not all patients are surgical. Um, sometimes they may have these functional um, disorders such as they're not using the vocal cords, right? Because they're squeezing a significant amount they may have had lesions on the vocal cord such as nodules or you know something a hemorrhage or something that resolves on its own but they're still having the behaviors or the compensatory measures that they once had um, when the lesion was there so that's when the vocal fold um, the uh, speech team is very integral and in kind of helping them work through that they also do swallow therapy for patients that are having swallow difficulties that are um, amenable to that. And then respiratory training for patients that have spasms of their vocal folds and just have these episodic um, um, breathing difficulties, um, respiratory training is um, done with these patients with the speech language pathologist. So this is just the tip of the iceberg. Again, I didn't even touch on any swallowing um, or any major tracheal resection um, procedures, um, but laryngology has so much breath um, and in addition to that, there's multiple approaches to the same disease process. So what I do is very different from what other people may approach, you know, for vocal fold um, or laryngeal abnormalities. And so it's really great to go to the meetings and kind of see what other people are doing and what's the latest and greatest um, that's occurring in laryngology. Um, so, you know, and laryngology, again, is only a fraction of what you see in otolaryngology. So, you know, you go through this residency and if something really piques your interest, then you can specialize in that. And then you could be the guru in that particular area. So I took the long path, you know, like we talked about, but typically for laryng otolaryngology, undergrad, four years, medical school, four years, residencies, five, and you're done after, um, what is that, 13 years. Um, but... If you want to do an extra training, you can, and you know, you could specialize in ears, you could specialize in head and neck cancer and flap reconstruction, you could do facial plastics, you can do um, sinus and skull based surgery, and you can do pediatric otolaryngology. All of these are one year, most of them for the most part. Neurotology across the board is usually two years. Um, and so, you know, don't let anything deter you from achieving your goals and your dreams. It will all fall into place. And wherever you go, whatever you do, it will be perfect for you. Um, you know, I was lucky enough to go where I wanted to go, but I really do think that, again, otolaryngology, we have such great people in the specialty that, um, you know, you would have, you could have a great time anywhere. Um, and so this is my family. We took pictures for Christmas. Um, any questions? Thank you so much for this session. This was amazing.
Thank you. Uh, there's a lot of people saying that they definitely learned a lot. We love the videos. The visuals are awesome. Awesome. Uh, we know that you do have to go, but we'll ask you, I guess, just like two questions real quick. Sure. Um, sure. One of the questions we had early on and that a ton of people seem to have was what, you know, as a part of a medical admissions um, committee, mm -hmm. what are your thoughts on virtual shadowing? Um, what has your program specifically decided to do? What do you think um, other programs might do? Um, so I am really, really excited about you and this initiative with socially distanced shadowing. It's important. Um, and I think that we probably should incorporate it um, into our repertoire, particularly because of the COVID pandemic. I mean, we don't know when we're going to get back to any sense of normalcy. Um, you know, and it doesn't look like it's anytime soon. Um, and some people may not feel comfortable, um, you know, even particularly with ENT. I mean, it's it's high risk because we're in the nasopharynx and we're in the airway. And so, you know, I oftentimes tell my residents, stay out the room um, if I'm doing complicated patient that, you know, is suspicious for it. So um, I think that there is a role for it. You know, now that we have the technology too, I think that we can implement it. Um, and now that I've had the opportunity to do this, on this platform, I'm gonna bring it back to my chair and see that we can, um, if we can implement it. And for, as, as a person that sits on the admissions committee, I think seeking out these opportunities um, and just being diligent, like we, we pe people may not have ENT programs at their institution. So this is another reason why this is important too. And seeking out those opportunities and then subsequently following through and getting mentors and, you know, speaks volumes to us, you know, just the go-getter attitude it speaks volumes to us. So I think, you know, kudos to y'all for starting it and put it on your application, you know, wherever you end up or whatever you wind up doing. Um, but it's, it's invaluable. It's invaluable right now. Great. Thank you so much. I think a lot of people needed to hear that. Um, yeah. We had a ton of, ton of, ton of questions, um, but I think another one that we had earlier on that was interesting was um, just how you can manage um, patients if they're going to be awake or if you're just doing a really simple test that have like a very sensitive gag reflex because this is something that happens pretty often. Right. Right, that's a good question. Um, so I always ask them if they're going to gag, do they gag when they brush their teeth? Um, that's the first question. And if they say they do, I always test anyway. So I use a tongue depressor for the oral cavity exam. We use tongue depressors and I may try and elicit the gag by touching the back of their tongue. And if it's a very strong gag um, and they're not comfortable with it, then we say, you know what, we're probably not going to be a candidate for a weight procedure. If they're like, okay, I want to try it. Um, then we try it. And I tell them, you don't have to be a hero. You know, you're not going to get any like superpowers or points for, you know, not gagging or throwing up and like being uncomfortable, you know, to the point of pain. So that's the last thing that I want to do. Um, so if they can't do it, they can't do it. And I think I've had two patients um, that just couldn't do it. And it was fine. We just stopped. They wanted to keep going. I'm like, no, <laughs> your mascara is running and you look like you're in pain. So I think we should stop. <laughs> um, however, um, awake procedures are tricky and you have to be really good at establishing rapport with your patient and establishing trust. And then numbing is also important, but I think giving them the time to digest the process and how it's going to work and being very explicit about, okay, now I'm going to inject. It tastes really funky. It's going to make you cough. You're going to feel really numb and you may not be able to swallow really well, but that's okay. You know, and that's the anesthesia working, just reassuring them. Um, is important. So I spend a lot of time like befriending my patients and earning that trust too, so that the procedure will go smoothly. And just, I mean, just because you're a doctor, you want to be able to establish that rapport with them. So it's time consuming, but it's worth it. And it really helps with the weight procedures. So thank you so much for those questions. Um, there were a ton of questions. So we put your Instagram, we'll okay. do it again. So if anyone has any questions, if they want to follow you, Definitely yep. go follow Dr. Snap. I'm going to copy and paste it in the chat again. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks well, a lot. Thank presentation so much. And yep. I will not forget how to say laryngology ever again. So. <laughs> I know. I was like, man, I got to learn how to say this. If I'm going to go into this specialty, it took me a while too. So it's okay. <laughs> yeah.
Yeah, so thank you so much. We appreciate it. There's so many comments in the chat.